Welcome to this course on public-private contracting. Today, we will talk about incomplete contracting and contract renegotiation. As you know, because we already discussed about this in other parts of this course, several contract theories coexist. Some of them are considering that contracts are incomplete and potentially renegotiated. Others are more interested in complete contract framework, studying contracts that are supposed to be enforced without any need for renegotiation. What I would like to stress during this talk is that in the real world, as soon as you consider long-term contracts, renegotiation is the rule, not the exception. Of course, as soon as you accept this, many consequences follow concerning the efficiency of contracting and the way to contract. Maybe let me first precise what I call renegotiation. What I call renegotiation here is the fact that, at some point, the terms of the initial agreements are modified in a way that was not envisioned in the initial agreement and that are crucial for the contract execution. So we are talking about substantial amendments. Change concerning prices, contract duration, needed investment, quality targets are examples. OK, so now that we know what we are talking about, are those renegotiations frequent? Renegotiations are the rule, not the exception. This is the main message of this talk. Here you've got some statistics coming from studies concerning France, United States, Latin American countries, different countries, different sectors. Maybe the most famous empirical studies is the one coming from José Luis Guache in 2004, where he looked at more than 1,000 concession contracts, and what he found is that many of them, more than 50% of the contracts, were renegotiated very soon after their signature, on average less than two, year, two years after their signature. This leads uh, Gouache, Lafon, and Strobe in their 2008 IGIO paper to state that such high rate of contract renegotiation have raised serious questions about the viability of the concession model. But whatever the country considered, public contracts are characterized by a high probability of renegotiation. What is true for less developed countries in José Luis Gouache studies is also true to a lesser extent for developed countries. Renegotiation is not only a question of institutions at work. So why contracts are renegotiated? Mainly for bad and good reasons. Many possibilities. As soon as specific investments are involved and parties are in a lock-in situation, in a long-term contract, renegotiation might occur because contracting parties are opportunistic. The parties, the public side or the private side, might look for renegotiation in order to increase their share of the appropriable quasi-rent. For example, also because it was initially agreed by the parties, when, for example, it is a way for the public authority to make acceptable the privatization of some public services to start with, a very low price, knowing that it will be soon renegotiated. So in those two cases, renegotiation are bad because it is a way to renege on initial commitments. But renegotiation might also occur for good reasons, because of unexpected events, not anticipated by the parties. And so you need to adapt the contract to be sure that the contracts stay efficient uh, through time. So let me give you one example showing that sometimes it is not so easy to determine what is driving renegotiation. Let me give you the example of the VELIB. Everybody knows about the VELIB. VELIB is a contraction between VELO, bicycle, and LIBERTÉ, LIBERTY. VELIB was launched on July 15, 2007 in Paris. It is based on a 10 years contract, 10 years long contract, between the city of Paris and J.C. Deco, a private company. And the company agreed to invest in more than 20,000 bicycles and more than 1,450 stations to provide the service. But two years after the contract began, parties had to renegotiate the contract. Why? Because of Parisian vandalism. 68% of the bicycle, by the end of the first year of the contract, had been touched by vandalism broken bicycle, stolen bicycle, and this was not anticipated in the contract. So the city accepted to renegotiate the contract and to pay partly for this. So this is a good example of a renegotiation in order to adapt to the environment. It wasn't anticipated. Parisian people are happy with the VELIB, and it is important to renegotiate the contract in order for the VELIB to survive. Another possible story is that J.C. Deco, the private company, could have anticipated this. The company already faced such problems in other big cities. And on purpose, this company might have signed a contract anticipating low level of vandalism 
in order to win the contract and to have a good excuse to renege the contract ex post. So nobody knows for sure if this renegotiation is a good one or a bad one. What are the consequences and the solution? So what do we learn from this? What we learn from this is that the contract must be based on credible commitments, especially when we are talking about public contracting. Usually those contracts are, um, are starting with a call for bid procedures. And so what is the point if you select the best offer just to renegotiate very few months after the contract's in nature? But at the same time, the contract must be flexible enough to adapt to avoid maladaptation cost. So the right mix is difficult to find, and sometimes when this is too difficult, there is a need for regulation. There is a need for a specific, a complex, a costly governance structures. Without going so far when complexity is not too high, contractual solutions exist. So what are the contractual solutions? Contract must precise as much as possible what the contracting parties are committing for, of course, but renegotiation must be allowed and anticipated. Even if you cannot precise at the signature date of complete contingent contract, you must precise how and in which situation renegotiation will occur. Who will renegotiate? How many people? What if no agreement is reached? The contract must specify the governance structures that will be used in order to renegotiate contracts and to make them adapted to their environment. Transparency is another crucial dimension. Renegotiation is obviously a win-win game. Both parties accept to renegotiate. But because we are talking about public contracts, we must keep in mind that all the stakeholders are not around the renegotiation table. So there is a clear need for transparency. And uh, those public contracts are very, always very often touched uh, with those renegotiations. And this transparency is also a way to be protected against what we call third-party opportunism that are common in public contracting, as we will see in another talk.